as well. So go ahead. Who's going to go first? Adela, let's hear from you first. Take away from your most recent classes. Okay. Um, we've, well, you missed a lot of classes. That's on your end. But I think mm -hmm. for me, um, the fire. Um, fire safety class was quite um, quite an eye opener for me because it's something that affects every part of whatever kind of facility you're dealing with. Um, and the most important part was to understand that the nature of fire you're experiencing will determine the kind of um, um, equipment you are going to be using. But more importantly is also the fact that there has to be a fire preparedness. That means. Mm -hmm you have to have a plan. There has to be a strategy on how you're going to tackle fire if it, if it ever occurs. So it should never sure. catch you unawares. Yeah, sure. so that for me was very, very important that regardless of no matter how small the facility is, there must be a plan for fire safety. Sure. Um, and that was for me a very important um, take away. Yeah. Yeah, I think- it, it's not enough. It's not enough to say we have measures in place to prevent fire. We must prepare for if fire does happen, right? Yes. And another thing he pointed out was that the, um, the personnel and people using the facility must understand there must be a plan which should be visible to everyone, a process to say that if there's fire, this is the first step to take, this is the second step to take, mm -hmm. this is the third step. Mm -hmm. And everybody has to be aware of that action plan is not just enough right. to have a plan on ground the um, users of the facility yeah. must understand that there's a process to if a fire occurs and i think mm -hmm. there should be that awareness so for me that was um important okay. yeah and Super. um let me see i'm flipping through my notes <laughs> no it's fine <laughs> one is okay i okay. just want everybody so, to give one 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 key lessons um it's important that I, right. I get to connect with what you're learning. Samuel, no, Samuel wasn't here when I, okay, Samuel was, Samuel, go ahead, give us your takeaway from your most recent class. One, one item. Yeah, yeah, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, welcome. Yeah, Um. so uh, my major one that I still remember very well is about studies, um, fire fighting and the code. And the in the lecture, I get to understand that there are some um there are different kind of fire institutions we can use for different kind of um fire. There is separate one that we can use when it is um gas, there is separate one you can use when it is um something different. So the um it was being explained deeply and widely enough to us that okay, we can't just speak any form of um, fire extinguisher and use to all kind of fire. So I think um, that's the major one. And the other one I can still talk about uh, um, AC, um, air condition maintenance. Just give one. I want to give everybody an opportunity to give one at least. So you've talked about types of fire extinguishers for different types of types fire. Of fire. That's a fantastic exactly. lesson. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, let me hear from Kingsley. Hello, good evening, sir. Good evening, welcome. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, the class has been an eye opener all this while. Uh, starting from the AC class, the electrical class, we talk about LC system, how important it is. AC, AC class talks about uh, the purpose for we to have our environment clean, air clean. And that is one of the purpose we have air and showed us also the um, the, the maintenance techniques you use for AC and uh, why those things should be observed. Like we having a space for ventilation for AC, which will help with prevent fire and all those things. We last class we talk on fire also. I will also say this, the class on fire really opened my eye. We had a drill a few days ago. Um, we brought out, we invited the Lagos State um, 
fire marshals mm -hmm. to come and take the right. drill for us. So yeah. one lesson I learned there, we have different extinguishers, the foam, the CO2, the color code all understood. And uh, there's one point I need to put in here. We bought out a CO2, which was cartridge, um, is a cartridge type. Uh, that cartridge type failed. When we wanted to, when we were carrying out the fire drill, we brought out, brought out the first cartridge type, we opened it, the pressure they didn't come out immediately. Mm -hmm. It took mm -hmm. a while. We dropped that one. We brought another one. Try to squeeze. It didn't come out until we went and bring uh, the CO2 that has a gauge that we are sure, yes, this one is fully charged before we had to trigger and the thing came out. So, the, what, what am I bringing there now? That CO2 with a cartridge head irrespective of how we have been servicing it all the while, even we just recently serviced it, still failed us. Why? Because we didn't know the status at which inside, the pressure inside has already discharged, but it doesn't have a gauge for you to tell that ah, this thing is discharged. So I'm bringing this thing up here that everybody should know that that cartridge is not reliable. We, so we now decided to go for the, the one that has a pressure gauge where you can really tell uh, that this one is pressured, pressurized, and when you open it, can, it will give you that. So we, but we took that point home and we now ask for replacement of everything. Okay. Please put a, pic, put, a picture, put a picture of both types on your platform today, if you can. Okay, okay, okay. And, I will and do make that. this explanation. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will. I will. I will typically go for the neck of the fire extinguisher maintenance uh, company. If I try a fire extinguisher doing a drill and it doesn't work, when I've done maintenance on it regularly, um, yeah. there are certain scams that they normally play around the maintenance because they know that um, you don't normally check. You don't have a specific way of checking well, on what checking. they have done. Yes. So they just come in, take it to the back of the building, shake it, shake it, relay belly, and put it back, and you think it's been done. So um, there are several lessons from there. Not just the fact that that type is not reliable. No, that that's not the only lesson you learn from there. Uh, the biggest lesson you might need to learn will be scamming you. Okay. Okay, sir. And my last. Uh, class was on the last one we talk about which one talked about FM technology. Uh, we can't talk about FM without bringing in technology because that was the introduction of the teacher. He said, "What is an, uh, what is uh, facility management?" Uh, we tried describing it and also omitted FM technology. So it's a uh, facility management is all about the space, the people, the process, and the technology. So in the class of technology, opened our eye to see. The technologies uh, involved in FM, just like diesel management system, how it helps you to track uh, your daily consumption, help you to make decisions on your future uh, planning, and also know when theft is being going on in your facility. We talk about diesel management system, we talk about uh, different kind of uh, FM technology introduced in FM that has really helped, which we cannot just uh, overlook. So the class was more fun and uh, interactive. So I think Fantastic. this is uh, what I'm... Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Kitty. That was awesome. Uh, who's going next? Let's see, Luka, are you ready? OK, so good evening, sir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, for me, my takeaway is basically on every aspect that was treated, especially the HSC aspects, where we are open up to a lot of um, method of uh, um, how to plan your work and uh, knowing that the PTW system also helps in uh, managing the risk as well as um, knowing the kind of job where the PTW is required. So for me, it was uh, very enlightening because in my system already, we apply, we use the PTW for our activities and uh, it really opened my mind to many more, more of uh, kind of broaden my knowledge about the PTW and as well as the HSC aspect of uh, um, our operations. And um, basically 
Also, if I could delve into it, uh, link it to my operations where we do it and the distribution, uh, I also see the essence of um, the firm management system. We are out to manage and get the values of um, what your consumption is. That also is an eye opener for me too, because um, I know a lot of fraud happen in this system where uh, our people will say they will, they, will, they will personally create issues of leakages along the front line and say, uh -huh, but then you cannot get accurate, but accurate values of the consumption rate. So now that has also given me uh, a solution on how to manage such situation. Like this is um, knowing the facility um, condition. First of all, like going around this facility to know exactly if those physical checks that we need to carry out to know how to manage the flow and then the, 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 the leakages so that you, nobody will come tomorrow and tell me that the, we lost this quantity of oil. And, or of course, in the, in the situation where you are having leakages, you need to also call the environmental team to also have an assessment of the environment. So HSC and that operational aspect really opened me to more broader understanding of what I need to do in terms of facility management. Thank you very much, sir. Super, thank you so much, Ndika. All right, I'll take one more volunteer to give us a takeaway, and then I'll go into today's program. Who is going to go next? Okay, okay, I, th I think that um, those who want to speak have already spoken and the others came late, so um, it's okay, you're all welcome. Uh, today, I want to introduce someone who's joined the class. Um, uh, Nuruddin, are you able to share your, show your video so that the class can meet you? Uh, we are agreed in this class that we're going to be showing our videos in every class. Uh, when we are having discussions so that we get to meet ourselves, that we're having a virtual class with only that will be on ghost mode to each other. Okay, so please, let's come on screen, everybody. I want to have an introduction of Nuruddin. Uh, Barakat, there was someone else that joined the class last week. Uh, who was that? Um, that's Yomi Sholaja. Yes, Yomi, are you here? Yes, Yomi is here. So Yomi will also be introducing himself. Um, so both of you will introduce yourself, tell us uh, your names, where you work, what you do, and uh, you know, just anything you want to tell us about yourself so we get to meet you as a member of this class. So that's uh, Nuruddin and Yomi. Every other person, kindly please open up your video. It's just gonna cost you extra five naira of data. <laughs> yeah. Unless you are under a blanket, because it's also possible that some of you are, are not in the classroom mode. It will not work. This class is a formal program. When you get to the exam, I'm sure you understand better. Okay, someone is uh, having an issue with internet. That's Adiola, okay. Who else has a stable internet that can show video? Don't worry, ladies, even if you didn't make your makeup, don't worry, you're fine like that. Just, just put on your video. Um, if you're in a room where you have um, where you have uh, uh, a window, uh, it's better to be facing the window than to be back in the window. So your face is not dark. Uh, Chinere, your hand is up. Okay, having an issue with internet. Okay, yeah, I'm having issues with internet. It keeps going off and on. Please, okay. the the, admit, the right. person who is admitting me also okay. attest to that. It's uh, okay. it's very unstable. Okay, no problem. All right, Nuri, then are you ready to introduce yourself now? It's new within us to have an internet problem.
No, we do not Um, what about your Miss Solaja? Okay, um, good evening, everyone. My name good is evening. um, your Miss Solaja. Can we see uh, your face, please? Um, okay. Can you see my face now? No video yet. No, no image yet. It's just your name is Susie. It, it's like it's I'll, a dark, I'll it now. dark screen. So maybe your your camera is not not up. Uh yeah, me. Do you want to uh, check on your camera and see what's going on? One Rudin can take the nobody can come on screen now and then and then introduce himself. Why Yami is trying to sort out his camera. Hello, good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh where's Nerudin now? I'm not seeing your face. Is your camera up? Okay, go ahead and speak. Okay. Go ahead and speak, Nurudin. Okay, good evening, sir. Good evening. Can you hear me now? Yes, your audio okay. is good. My my name is Nurudin Palawale Adejima. I reside in Rocha, Rocha State. I'm a system. So I got this information through. I've been looking ahead of to become a facility manager since why? So there's no information, no awareness of that. So I got the information through one of my colleagues that went to uh, high institution together then. So when I heard about the information, I was so glad that ah, this is what I've been looking for so long that I've been, uh, what's it called? I've been, I had, I had intention to be a facility manager as well. I've been looking for how do I get this information? How do I go about it? But God just used this a friend of mine to, uh, as a point of connection to get to know uh, Mr. Paul Erubami. So I really cherish this program a lot. And I've been, for so for some minutes ago, I've been enjoying the class. Uh, so I'm so excited. Just to say that I'm okay. so excited. I'm very, very happy. Thank you very much. You are you are welcome, Nuruddin. We are happy to have you here. Uh, I just need to point out what I told you before. You have a lot to cover. Yeah, you have to watch all the videos read all the materials, do more studies to prepare for your exam because everything is being recorded and you can still catch up if you are really, really net deep into this. It's not a part-time. Uh, that we're doing it in the evenings and weekends does not mean that um, it's not that intense. It's three months of intense work. Um, and I don't want any of you to uh, be surprised by the exam. Don't be surprised by it. I need to just tell you upfront. But if you don't prepare yourself, it's going to hit you hard. Okay, so don't take it as a wishy washy, come there, one thing or the other um, uh, uh, kind of program. It's a formal program. And I'll tell you more about um, you know, the formality and the level of certification this program is going to give you as soon as I hear from uh, the next uh, new joiner. Mr. Yami, please go ahead. Uh, no, not Yami. Um, Solar Jack. Yes, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, Good evening. Yeah, my name is Shmi Sholaja. Uh, I'm an integrated logistics management professional. And uh, I, I worked with, uh, uh, with Planet Project for a couple of years as uh, the facility manager before I came in contact with Mr. Paul Ruban. 
And uh, I've been uh, a facility manager with about five years experience, but I don't have certification to keep up. My experience opened me up to a lot of uh, opportunity that is attached to this uh, field of uh, profession. And I intend to take it further, you know, and that's the reason why I'm joining this class to get myself exposed to the rudiments, to the required, you know, taking it further Thank to you. the next level. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we have, we have, um, how would I start this? We have a huge challenge before us. In the FM industry in Nigeria, we have 10 to 20,000 people who needs to be trained on our own. We can reach about two to 3,000 of them by our own efforts. But with all of your efforts together as a class and as an alumni, which is heading towards a thousand in the, near, in the, in the nearest future, we can actually reach more than 20,000 people with the good news of what we're doing in the FM diploma. Yeah. So I'm saying this because I think our, our uh, uh, advocacy uh, for this program has not been very, very effective. And I need to encourage everyone to put in the extra effort of reaching out to people in your networks. Let me assure you, everyone who has come out of asset management, project management, construction management, building, all of the engineering, architecture, uh, all of the design, business, uh, whatever, just list all the courses that are uh, in a way uh, related to managing people and places in the universities. Everyone that has met and grasped facility management early in their career have leapfrogged their entire classmates and their seniors in less than two years in earnings, in reputation and level in the industry. Everyone. And you are in the program today in the next two years, you will not even believe your fortunes, what you are going to be seeing about your own career. You will not even believe it. I get calls about, I want to switch job, and I'm telling you, don't switch job. You, it's too early to switch job, no matter how much they are offering you. That's what I'm contending with, because once you are done with this program, you really qualify. The vacancies chasing you are going to be far more than the number of you. What we started out as this program, we started out as uh, an internship providing organization. We will, we will feed everybody into an internship pool. I will tell companies to please uh, you know, take them on and let them have experience, six months of internship experience. Now, we were the one marketing that. Now the companies are the ones coming to us to say, who do you have for internships? And quite honestly, for the last one year, we have not been able to supply companies interns from our graduates. Why? Even before they finish the program, there are one, two, three interviews they attend. They already know their value. They already know how to price themselves well, and they're already getting good jobs. So internships no longer work, even though it's part of our program. People are getting direct job placements. And for those who are already working, they are already getting promotions that are double their salaries and getting new jobs, offers that are taken away from their employers into other employment, uh, uh, other opportunities, and it's happening so fast. So why do you sit on such an opportunity and not you know, tell others to come and take advantage of it? I really will want you, everyone, to become ambassadors, advocates of this uh, uh, a program. Uh, Barakas will share a, a folder of graphics that has posters, banners, flyers. Uh, Barakas, please make note of that. Share it with the class so that each person can download different, uh, you know, uh, banners and folders um, from the folder and be able to um, uh, post 
in Facebook, post, post in uh, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, everywhere uh, with the link so that people can uh, click on the link and, and, and join in and register because you are going to be a bearer of good tidings because of uh, what you have found. Now, there's another very good news, very big news. I just tidied that up today. We are having a digital badging system for the FM Mastercraft Diploma. What this means is that uh, in the next few days, you're going to be seeing online graduates from this program able to post their digital badges on all social media to say, this is my verified accomplishments. Now that badge is not going to just be a badge, an image, a banner. No, it's going to be a verifiable badge that people can click in, get into a portal that shows them all of the competencies you've acquired, all of the uh, 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 you know, uh, skills you have gained, the exams you have passed, you know, all of the things you have done to earn that, earn that badge. It's going to be in a live portal and we're going live with that. So that's our beginning of certification program. So that whenever you have your LinkedIn profile, your CVs, you will put in the badge in there, in your LinkedIn profile, in your CVs, say, I have this qualification that will stand you out completely in the industry. People looking for FM to employ today are looking for people who are certified, who are qualified. And uh, you form the crops, you form the uh, major uh, stock as far as Nigeria is concerned. But we don't want to keep this number small. We don't want to keep it um, to just a few, almost like a secret. We want you to blow this out of proportions, blow it into, the, um, uh, into your network so that we can have a very good number uh, taking advantage of it. Let me tell you the advantage of having more people qualified. One, we are building a vibrant professional body, a group of people who know, who, who have a sense of belonging, a large professional organization. Two, companies create more opportunities when they know that there's a professional stock. If somebody is looking for a, 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 a role to employ today, they want to employ somebody today, they're probably looking for admin officer, they're probably looking for logistic officer, they're probably looking for uh, corporate service officers, instead of calling them FMs, right? But the more we add this, you know, drumming out the, uh, the, the profession, the more companies know that it is facility manager they are looking for, not admin, not secretary, not uh, receptionist, not... Uh, 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 you know, whatever they, they call them right now. So we'll turn that around. And that will also open more opportunities for businesses. So companies come out to say, um, I'm looking for companies who can manage my facility. I'm looking for companies who can provide this or that service. They know exactly uh, uh, where to go because we have formed a large body of professionals. That is the kind of thing that elevates us collectively, not just individually, okay? And finally, um, all of us belong to one company or the other. Most of the things we teach in this program are practical. Not everything um, you'll be able to find uh, other consultancies or FM companies being able to implement for your organization. But we can assure you that everything we teach, Max Gold can deliver as a service, either as consultants or as such service providers. So if you're in a company that's looking for FM companies to hire, please don't look, don't look at Max Migod as, oh, we just provide the training and as such, we are not providing the services. No, we provide services. And if you are trying to do condition assessment, uh, tagging of your assets, uh, deploy any kind of technology, both for managing the building and managing the facility management services, we have you covered on all ends. Energy efficiency, we have you covered as well. We are into beam and all types of technology. So please do not say, oh, we're just learning, we're just learning. No, you can actually achieve the implementation of everything you are learning in this program. If not in the future, it is now, okay? So talk to us if you need uh, assistance implementing yourself. Talk to us if you need to outsource to experts in the industry to deliver any kind of technology or management system for your FM department or your organization, okay? All right. Let's see, do I have a chance? Okay. 
All right, I'm going to just go straight to share my screen. And we have a very fantastic subject to go through today. I hope we've all had time to look at the slides. Is my screen up now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, I can see your screen now. Super. So today we are looking at sustainability and energy management. You know, when we talk about sustainability, green comes to mind, uh, waste, curtailing waste comes to mind, uh, the future comes to mind, and so many things. So into this uh, class, we're going to look at uh, the broad concept of sustainability, the business application of sustainability using the triple bottom line, and the FM application of sustainability looking look, using the eight aspects of sustainability, right? So we're going to look at it generally, the way the uh, uh, United Nations will look at sustainability. We're going to look at it as a business. We are a business support function in facility management, right? So we need to look at sustainability from the standpoint of the organization. You know, when you look back at your strategic facility planning, you are elevating yourself beyond just we support, we do things on the background at the background. You are elevating yourself to being able to understand the business at the highest level. How does the CEO, the CFO, the uh, CIO, and all, all the O's in the uh, all the chief O's in the organization? How should they? How do they perceive or see sustainability? So I look at the triple bottom line. What is the real the real value of an organization? What is the uh, what can how can you ascribe success to the organization? And then we'll not bring that to our own field as facility managers. How does our work contribute to that global definition and that corporate definition of sustainability? What are the specific areas we work in that can show contribution to the triple bottom line and again up to the um, uh, 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 sustainability goals, um, of, you know, at, at a global level. Okay, you know the the, the ground rules um, of the class. Um, cost objectives and the, the the outlines. We all have these. So sustainability, what? What does it mean? The ability to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That is the, that is the summary. Can we eat and think about how future generations will eat? Can we include ourselves? And think about how future generations will clothe themselves. Can we uh, house ourselves? And think about how future generations will house themselves. Imagine um, housing the way we know it today. Just look at the various companies that go into housing. Are they able to regenerate so that future generations can also have things like that to house themselves? Or are we consciously using things up in our own generation? That's the kind of thinking that elevates you above your level as an FM up to the level of your corporate, your organization, and above the level of your organization to being part of national and international global discussions around the things we do because the big macro outcomes that the world sees today, like all of those uh, flooding, a quarter of Pakistan is covered today in flood, storms, 
taking over large swaths of the United States today. Ice increasing in some areas, fires ravaging Europe, and so many. Even here, the amount of lopsidedness in flooding in certain areas above their expectation and droughts in certain areas above their expectation. Think about it. Lake Chad has about 40 million people to take care of. It's now less than 10%. It has dried to less than 10% of its volume. That has affected agriculture, livelihood for more than 40 million people. But those are the large global, international, and national outcomes we see. But what contributes to these large outcomes? That's where it now concerns us. What are the things we do as facility managers to show that we are concerned, that we can do the little in our own sphere of influence to contribute to slowing down the rate of degeneration, increasing the rate of regeneration and sustainability. When we say we do not inherit the edge from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children, it means that we always need to have a sense of indebtedness for all the resources that we have access to. So how do we make money? Of course we want to make money. Every organization today wants to make money. Even the so-called NGOs, non-profit organization, they all want a surplus in their books. Governments wants to make money. So economical uh, viability or profitability is paramount. In fact, uh, in the triple bottom line, the economic bottom line seems to be the most prominent. It is the oldest sense of reasoning. Anybody going to a business is thinking first about the economic bottom line. We need to make money, we need to make profits. Some have come to try to postulate that when you now start thinking sustainability, you start focusing less on profitability. That is a worse kind of fallacy. Sustainability requires you to make profits because it is only by making profits that you can stay in business. If you don't make profit, your mission is going to dwindle and die. If you have a thousand enterprise, in the states, a thousand enterprises in the states, and over time, majority of them are not making profits. Before you know what's going on, the enterprise will all die. The economy will eventually die with it. So, a profitable business contributes to a profitable economy that can help to spur a global, you know, economy. That's why economic viability or profitability is a sustainability bottom line. So you must learn to keep making profits. So when we talk about that, and we're talking about you must cut out waste, you must uh, think of using resources uh, justifiably, you must be able to write good business cases to get you know funding approved and be able to get return on investment and so on and so forth. They come in there. And then you're talking about environmental bottom line. You have to be environmentally responsible. What does this mean? We tap resources from the earth, whether it's aquatic resources, uh, subterranean uh, resources, the one we drill from, from the soil, um, agro-based resources, uh, resources from the air, from the uh, 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 ecosystem above ground, and so on and so forth. We tap and tap and tap. We use some for materials, we use some for energy, you know, and so on, we consume all kinds of resources. Every time resources are taken from the earth, we need to ask ourselves, how quickly can the earth regenerate so that there will be those resources available later? How can we use it in a responsible manner? Because that responsible manner means that you are tapping and you're also conscious that you should not over tap so that it can still be there. Imagine, Imagine going fishing. You have 
a community of fishermen. And then they keep reducing the size of their nets every year to the point where even fish eggs or fingerlings are being fished out of the water. At some points, there will be no fish anymore. You can all go to the sea or the, the river and try to fish and find nothing to bring home. But if you want to fish that river responsibly, we'll all agree on how big our nets should be so that we do not, nobody catches fishes that are less than a certain size. We also need to agree on certain periods when we will give the uh, uh, rivers a breeding space so that nobody is going there to fish, so that they can grow a little bit. And then we can use this wider net to come and fish. These are things that our ancestors knew about sustainability. But greed, selfishness, and MMM mentality, and I hope you understand what that means, Ponzi schemes have made us to become so self, you know, conscious, me first, me only, that we no longer follow those time-tested sustainability principles that our ancestors have used over the years. Environmentally responsible. You even have in some uh, folk tales and, and, and tribal folklore and, and stories about certain birds we don't eat, certain animals we don't hunt, certain on and on. You may think these things are spiritual. It's all sustainability. These species were probably endangered at some point, and some elders thought, you know, well, let's just you know, create a story around, we don't eat this, we don't eat that, we don't kill this, we worship this, we do that, we do this. So that those species can, you know, before they become extinct, there's so much wisdom in it. And then when we are tapping the resources, using them to make profits, we work with people. People will have to be the ones to do the job. People will have to be the customers to pay for it. People will have to live around those environments where that job is being done. How are we helping the people who are working? How are we helping the people who are paying whose money we want so badly? How are we helping those who are living in that ecosystem with the environment we are draining and tapping? And by the way, on the environmental side, again, we're not only tapping and draining, we are also dumping the, the waste back in. So sustainability is it, it, it's a very strategic way of thinking. It should guide all our decisions. Whether we are, as a company, pushing for sustainability or not. As an FM, if you are trying to elevate yourself in your career, in your profession, sustainability will guide you like a, a beacon to the right choices all the time. So planning is a key to successful sustainable initiative. A sustainable man manager, you know, you know, understands how to integrate people, place, and business of the nation in a way that optimizes economic, environmental, and social benefits of sustainability that I just explained. So we talk about these uh, eight major categories of sustainability. And we always we start with this first and most important areas or category of sustainability, which is energy. Energy is drawn from where? From the earth. So we talk about energy that is easily replaceable. And we call those ones renewable energies. If I plant sugar cane, I harvest it and I make me tend to fuel and power my factory today. In six months, sugarcane is back up. I can harvest it again. That's renewable. Because I, I can regrow it within one, two years. If I drill into the ground and I dig up all the coal deposits, all the crude oil, I'm using up 
resources that took tens of thousands of years, not six months, not one year, to build up in there. I'm using it so fast that if we continue at the rate we are going, oil, crude, gas, uh, uh, coal, and all of those things will be gone in a hundred years. They become, they become trace elements. Just the way we are dealing with gold and, and silver. So they become trace, they become difficult to find because we are consuming so fast that the earth can recreate. So what's the sense we need to have regarding energy as a, an area or category of sustainability? We want to slow the consumption down. And then we want to begin to focus more on easily renewable sources of energy, create and balance. We'll talk about this more. What about water? We use up a lot of water. Many people think that water is an infinite resource. It is wrong, not correct. Water is finite. It can finish. There are cities, there are countries that no longer have water resources available in their land. Some have been contaminated. Some are so deep that getting to whatever is available in the cross is almost impossible to get. Some have access only to sea water that takes an arm and a leg to purify, to make portable. You don't need to be in those environments to know the value of water. And for those of us who even find it easy, anywhere we drill 10 feet, 20 feet, you get water. Don't we use energy? Do we need to waste the water? Because if you're wasting the water, you're wasting two things. The energy that got it out and the water itself that is coming out and not going back perfectly. That water cycle is not a perfect cycle. And then you have materials and resources that we draw, use for furniture, our buildings, and everything. Our workplace management processes that have environmental impact. All the motions, all the uh, 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 decisions we make to buy things from God knows where, taking so many miles and miles and tons and tons of petroleum products to fly them into our, to our location and things like that. By the time you begin to think about your, your work processes, you might be you, you begin to think more local, start thinking more of using things around you than going far to go and get it, or getting people to gather. Every time you want to say one thing, yeah, everybody must come from Abuja and from Lagos and from Accra to come to Lagos and come and uh, have a discussion. You begin to think about more smarter ways of adjusting your processes so that we can, we can save the earth. Our indoor environments have also become an issue. We spend most of our lives indoors. And the indoor space, is more than 50% worse in environmental quality than the outdoor space. Even if the outdoor space is polluted, the indoor space is worse because there's a little bit of that outdoor environment in your indoor space is plus your consumption. All the things you brought in, the emission from your body, you're breathing out of carbon. Everything for that complicates your indoor space. And then quality of services, services that are sustainable and minimize the environmental footprint and then waste. Where does your waste go to? They go to the air to pollute it further. Can you reduce it? Can you reuse it? Can you recycle it? Site impact, you need to gauge the environmental impact and footprint of each building's operational processes. Every time you build, we obstruct certain natural habitats. If you dig into the ground, certain animals, Burrows and live in those spaces. Certain water flows take place on the ground. You put concrete in there, you block, you stop, you change things. 
you clear the ground, you divert water, you fill up and you build. All of these have impact on the environment. Animals are pushed out, birds are driven off, things change for them. Many of them are hunted down and killed. Bushfires are used to destroy many. But as we are doing this and occupying more and more, as we are urbanizing more and more, we are having worse environmental impacts. So the greenhouse gas emissions, the impact on the ozone layer, and all of those things that come out of urbanization affects the earth at a global level. And so we begin to see this impact as we, as we watch the news every time. So let's take these eight categories of sustainability and put them in perspective. There are inputs, processes, and outputs. The inputs are the energy, the water, materials, and resources. The processes are what we do and deliver for our users as property managers, workplace management, indoor environment, and quality of services. And the outputs are the residue, what we give out, what we put back into the environment. Okay. So, how does a business relate with all of this sustainability? Think about the business bottom line as the business performance reports. What did we make as a business? How are we faring as an organization? And the economic bottom line is pretty straightforward. If we spend 1 million and we sold 2 million, it means we have a margin of 1 million. So it's straightforward. We made money. If we made a loss, it's clear. We made a loss. And we want to make a profit all the time. That's sustainability. But the economic bottom line should not be handled exclusively. It should not be the only bottom line that the organization is trying to um, use to measure its performance. You need to also ask as an organization, what is our impact on people, the social bottom line? How are we improving lives of those who work with us? How are we improving lives of those we are serving? How are we improving lives of those our activities are impacting out there? Because if you are not having any human impact that is positive, you are failing as an organization. Organizations have begun to see this. In the last 20 years, a, sim a single news like um, so so and so companies using underage labor, for example, can destroy that company speedily. Take a luxury brand like, like Apple, for example. They had a few years ago uh, news about how some subcontractors in China were working for 18 hour shifts. People were committing suicide because of such really work circumstances that made it impossible for them to have a life. Why producing luxury item that was being perceived in the West as high grade, top end, a must have. As soon as the news broke, the company had to swing into action immediately because that is a negative on your social bottom line. All those business and all those billions you have in your economic bottom line will go down quickly if you are found wanting on the social bottom line. Chocolates and coffee makers, you know, tapping coffee and, 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 and cocoa beans from Africa and, and South America using child labor, for example, or using on, on ethical practices, buying them too cheap. People can't even, people can't even live normal lives, whereas Everything is being tapped and processed for billions to be declared by those companies. 
they go down quickly. So they guard that end. I start hearing of CSR, corporate social responsibility. What should we do to improve our social impact so we can upgrade ourselves and our social bottom line? That is a big bottom line today. And then you have the environmental bottom line. How are we impacting the environment? Companies are now beginning to uh, measure energy use, declare their sources of energy, calculate their carbon footprints, trying to go what they call net zero or carbon neutral, where they measure the uh, energy consumed, they measure their impact on the environment, impact on the ozone layer, ozone, 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 ozone layer and then they try to use uh, carbon credit, invest some of their economic resources on planting trees, on uh, regenerating rivers, on doing some things for the environment that helps to balance out their bottom line on the environmental impact scale. Because if you ignore any of these bottom lines, any of the three, you're going under as a business. So as facility managers, what should we learn from this? It is good that we're always teaching ourselves how to show value in terms of Nara and call. But please, begin to add value of what you do in terms of impact on people. Add value of what you do in terms of impact on the environment. Organizations will begin to appreciate your work because that shows that you are becoming more strategically inclined when you begin to look at triple bottom line in your uh, business cases and your, uh, your, 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 your resources, your information you're providing to senior management. So we need to walk away from all of this complete uh, devastation the earth is receiving today. And don't say that because my operation is too small, uh, I won't make a significant impact, therefore I should go ahead. No, 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 you can't do that. Even if it is just a tiny impact you are making, it is still an impact. The person who is sucking out the septic tank into a, 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 a drainage channel that goes into a stream or emptying out his uh, 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 oil from his generator change out into the gutters, for example, is harming the environment by that measure. Even if you think it's a small, small impact, that impact is huge because you are going to be destroying the livelihood of certain people down the stream when fishes are dying and unable to live in those waters. So ask yourself, for every decision you make as a facility manager, would this policy be equitable? Equitable is intersection between social and economic bottom lines. The social benefits outweigh the cost of the initiative. I want to help people, I want to help people. I want to help people while making a loss. That's what this person is about. I want to spend all our future profits in CSR projects. The answer is no, it's not equitable. We want to be positive on the social bottom line. We want to also be positive on the economic bottom line. That's equitability. The intersection between the social and the environment is bearable. It's an initiative that's producing a positive effect from the metal standpoint, having a negative impact on occupant productivity. Oh, use less energy. Let's not use too much energy. Let's dim all our lights. Is that dim lights? Dim lights will use less energy. The environment is happy, isn't it? But the people that are spending eight hours inside the building, they are going blind gradually. They're not seeing properly. They are struggling. Is that a positive or your social bottom line. You must have that balance. And the same thing goes for environment versus economic. This is what we call the viability, feasibility. Each of these are feasibility. 
the equitable feasibility, the variable feasibility, and the variable feasibility. Because every time you do a feasibility, you are trying to check two or three uh, parameters to see how you can create a balance, how you can satisfy two or three uh, you know, angles of the same matter. And for variable, can the solution be implemented? Will the benefits likely be realized outweigh the cost to implement? Oh, let's start a recycling project. Uh, we start doing recycling. We'll buy a shredder. We'll buy a compactor. We'll buy five different bins of different colors, blah, blah, blah. OK. How much will all that cost? 13 million. Fantastic. The harvest of waste that you are going to be segregating, all the paper separate, the can separate, the bottle separate, the oil separate, the compost separate. How much are you going to get from them? Zero. Oh, so this solution of sustainability for you is to take us minus 13 million a bit. Questions to ask. I had a friend once who uh, they tried to sell him a shaving powder. Um, and, 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 and when he heard, heard the price of the shaving powder, he was shocked. And he said, if the shaving powder is this much, after harvesting the baby, how much I will sell the baby? <laughs> that was a sustainability question. If you, if, you, if you need to do any of these initiatives, ask yourself, is it going to set you back on any of this bottom line? Because if it will, it is not sustainable. That's why you see sustainability in the middle of this triple bottom line. How do you make choices to ensure that you meet that sustainability? That's the ultimate feasibility. You've done the three feasibility, I automatically see that that decision is going to have a positive impact on all the triple bottom line. Then you can now say it is sustainable. So, how does the manager impact employees, suppliers, the community at large, the social bottom line, involve people in decision making? Think about one well being in your decision making, healthier environment for people to work in, and safer environments. These are focus areas for social. And then the environment consumption of energy, type, source, quantity of energy you are consuming, how output. I'll talk about that when we get to the energy so you can find out better. Waste, especially the waste that goes to landfills. Recycling, reusing, decreasing the emissions carbon footprints and eliminating hazardous waste, creating building processes that abolish toxic materials. Because every time you emit toxic materials, it further depletes the environment. And then the bottom line that is the most prominent. This is the one that your CFOs and CEOs are mostly going to be concerned about. Profitability. Your job is costing us so much money. It looks like we are going to go out of business because of effort. Lower your operating costs, increase asset value, return, higher return on investment, higher efficiency and long-term savings are priorities for the economic measures so that the economic bottom line can also be met as an effort. So not all organizations are ready for this, um, to be honest with you. Um, we are teaching you this so that you can become more strategic in your thinking. So you can also be ready when your organization is ready. But as an FM, you can approach sustainability either as an appointee of the organization where they say, you know what, the FM should come up with ideas to do this and do that. We want to achieve this and achieve that. How can FM contribute to it? That's the nation, you know, bringing you in now. We are ready as an organization for sustainability. But sometimes you come in as an insurgent. And insurgent, we start coming up with ideas. It's not being asked for those ideas. It's researching, it's creating the data, it's putting things together so that you can begin to speak more strategically in your normal operations. For example, an item that decides that it's going to cut energy bill and reduce toxic uh, uh, exposures in the facility by phasing out mercury tubes, fluorescent tubes from the facility, may not necessarily create a whole program around it. 
can start by using his operation budgets for changing light tubes to do phased change out of fittings. Give a proposal that shows my men that you can do a phase change out of fittings from space to space across the facility over a two, three year period without creating a new project for it, for it. And over this period, your energy bill is going to drop by X amount of, of money. It's insurgency. You are talking sustainability when you've not been invited to it. You are bringing some strategic ideas to the table. It elevates you. It brings value to the organization. You are invited to the table to have discussions with the bosses when important discussions and deliberations are going to be had in the future because you have shown yourself worthy of such discussion. Have I told you that if you are not sitting around the table, you are in the menu. When management is holding meetings and discussing high level stuff, survival, growth, and the rest of the big things that affect our businesses, if the FM is not being consulted, we are talking about the FM. And that's why whenever they get up from that table, what you hear is that we're going to downsize the FM. We're going to sack people. We're going to stop, stop buying this and buying that. We're stop approving this and approving that. You see yourself being the big thing suddenly because you were not on the table. You have always been on the menu. You never thought about how to get out of the menu and get on the table where you can be part of that conversation. Most likely you were waiting to be appointed. So where do you start? You start with what we call baseline. Where are we today on energy? How much energy are we using? Aggregates. How much energy are we using per, we call it metrics. Anything you, anything you take an absolute and you divide it by a measure or a unit, it's called a metric. If you are consuming liters of, of, of uh, diesel, that's all you've been measuring. Uh, move into a metric where you measure kilowatts coming out of every liter. So you can now say we are producing uh, 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 10 kilowatts out of every liter of diesel. Advance that to uh, we're using a thousand kilowatt hours per day and we have 100 people using the building. It means we're using 10 kilowatts to manage one person's use of this building. Uh -huh. Now you are creating proper baseline. We produce water. Many of us just pump the water to tanks and use it. Bah! And say, is it finished? Pump again. We are not measuring the energy going into the water pumping. We are not measuring how many liters we are pumping. We are not measuring how we're using the water. We just pump and use. You cannot have baseline data for sustainability until you have metrics. You meter everything, you measure everything, you analyze all your, your data, and you know exactly where you are. Because it is when you start measuring, start simple things like knowing how many people come into your building, the counts. Yeah, all those register they feel at the entrance. So you people have badging systems, go scan and go into the building and nobody's doing anything with footfall numbers. How does your footfall numbers affect the water used that day? How do they affect the energy used, for example? When there was COVID, everybody was shouting up and down. My man said, we are not using the building. The FMB is not going down. FM said, running at task. They try to make my men understand why bills should keep going up. <laughs> There's no way to explain it if you don't have baseline data. Start. This data is basic FM. We're not talking about sustainability yet. We are saying you cannot start advancing to strategic levels when at the operational level, you don't even have data that shows you what you are doing. So for a start, know all your costs, all cost metrics, cost per service, cost per square meter, cost per person, cost per day, all kinds of metrics. Know all your energy metrics. So gas, heating, compressed air, uh, you know, all metrics related to water, all metrics related to it. Waste, when they come, they come and carry refuse. How many tons of refuse do you generate? Do you know? 
how many tons of different types of refuse, if you were to segregate today, do you know? So this is where sustainability starts from. Basic FM is a foundation for sustainability. And then you start doing some things with that data. For example, you probably are paying money for Loma to come and carry your refuse. And you're paying them to visit your site every day to empty the refuse. But because you've now started using waste consignment record, and then you now started doing partial segregation where you now know the type of waste certain organizations can buy. You can begin to tell management that we can use our uh, segregated waste revenue so to recycling companies to pay for our loma bill. Thumbs up, low hanging fruits. I said about the light example. Instead of buying tubes everywhere to fill, buy a new fluorescent tube. You just collect all the working light tubes in one room, use them to replace the other ones that are dying elsewhere and change these ones to LED fittings. With the money you should have used to buy tubes. Low hanging fruit, we call them. Document achievements as you implement these steps. Many sustainability initiatives have been implemented without real data to show that there has been progress. Oh, we we'll just change to LED. Our light bill should come down. You change to LED, your light bill went up. My mind is confused. You two are confused. Why? You did not, you don't have a specific metering for lights. You have aggregate metering for the whole building. How would you measure the impact of reduction in changing of fluorescent to LED? Sorry, you won't get that impact. So measure and document. Set goals on what you are going to achieve. Celebrate the little achievements you make along the way. And then, begin to involve more people because sustainability is not something just like HIS, it's not something that you can do alone. We need, so you can, you can start with a few people who can reason with you. You can have a champion for management, someone who you see is body language, policies and behavior, shows that it's, it's sustainability inclined. You can start sharing ideas, having informal meetings and so on and so forth. You grow into a formal sustainability champion just by taking those uh, little by little steps. Because at the end of the day, you need to get management buying. You need to get that commitment that when you are into sustainability real, the company is not fully supporting. It starts from somewhere and you can grow that process. So we'll talk about the the, the low-hanging fruits as short-term uh, goals. You have your mid-term goals and long-term goals uh, that, are, that are built around certain sustainability practices. Because if you start from the uh, very advanced sustainability practice, you may not be able to achieve it and you may not be able to get that encouragement to do anything in the future. So you start from the low-hanging fruits. You develop initiatives that helps you and the small group you're working with to keep improving and advancing. You cannot make an advancement until um, you know that the little effort you've made before has a result that is that you can celebrate. Everybody can see that you've achieved that result. All right, so we'll talk about energy management. You know why we single out energy management? Of all the eight uh, categories of sustainability for FMs, energy is the most expensive in its impact, has the highest implication in negative impact, affects all of the other categories one way or the other, just by itself. Think about water, think about waste, think about all the rest. Energy affects them. And from our standpoint as facility management professionals,
sorry, I dropped off. I dropped off a little bit. Right, so the internet. Okay, so energy is a huge part of our operation. In a deregulated, in a deregulated environment, where you pay the real price for every energy source, they will find out that energy can easily account for more than half of your facilities costs, easily. Unless you are smart enough to take some of these things we're going to be talking about in this lesson to heart, implement them, and get better. Otherwise, energy can actually drain all of your resources, all of your profits as the facility management department or company. I've talked about the source of energy before, uh, for say, renewable, nuclear, uh, you know, solar and the rest. All of them are just, uh, I categorize them as uh, perpetual when we talk about the solar and the, uh, the wind and the, uh, you know, sea waves um, uh, to the renewable uh, that includes the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, organic sources, uh, plant sources, nuclear sources, and the rest to the fossil, fossil fuels that are, uh, you know, not uh, easily replaceable. For us as facility managers, let's learn the real principle of energy management. Energy, when expended in production, should increase. In effect, the more energy you consume, the more profitable you should be as an organization. That's the bottom line. If I have a school of 1,000 students and I use one megawatt hours of electricity in a, in a year, by the time I'm using two megawatts, that means I'm having multiples of 1,000 students. Isn't it? That's the whole idea. So we are not saying stop increasing your energy consumption or reduce your energy consumption. We say improve your energy performance. Performance is measured using metrics. A basic metric to consider here is what we call the energy use intensity. How much energy? per square meter, how much energy per user of your building, how much energy. That's the way to think about energy performance, such that my total energy can keep increasing, but my energy use intensity should keep decreasing. If I use 10 kilowatt hours of energy, electricity to serve one student in a year. I want to have more students. So my total energy should keep increasing, but my energy used per student should keep dropping from 10 kilowatt hours to nine, to eight, to seven, to six. That is energy performance improvement. That is your main focus. If you don't have data on metrics, you cannot be talking sustainability or energy performance improvement. If the total humility is all you are measuring and calculating, then, for example, you run diesel for a whole day and you recorded I spent, I used 100 liters. The next day you run diesel for a whole day and you recorded I used 100 liters. And that's what you are measuring. But on day one, there were 15 people in the building. On day two, there were 300 people in the building. How do you relate the 100 liters you spent on day one to the 100 liters you spent on day two? You see how sometimes we walk completely opposite. Because if I was working on my metrics, I will see that on a particular day, I've been, I've been wasteful because for just 50 people in the building, I probably ran a very big generator, which I didn't need to. 
I wasn't thinking about the metrics of energy. Continue to improve your energy performance as you increase energy consumption. The goal is to improve performance measured in terms of cost, absolute use, various energy use ratios such as kilowatt hours per additional units, and so on and so forth. So, set goals. I want to use less energy per person, per product output, per whatever. I want to use more energy derived from renewable sources. We may not be able to cut out fossil fuels automatically, but let's begin to introduce certain hybrid approaches so that the percentage of renewable sources of energy keeps increasing. In the past, it used to be very expensive to even introduce solar into your mix of energy. But now it's becoming more and more reasonable. There are times of the day when you don't need all that power in the building. Use energy in a more socially and environmentally responsible manner. You might think it's, you can afford it. I've seen some places where they will go and put some, uh, you know, uh, air conditioning devices. In, in, in lobbies and corridors that are open to the entire uh, garden, for example, trying to cool the whole world because you can afford the energy. That's irresponsible, socially and environmentally. Not caring about the building fabric because you can pay for the energy is irresponsible. Understand energy consumption and purchasing. How are your bills calculated? Many of us don't have a clue. We see the bill, we go and pay. And we say we're doing FM. We see the bill, whether it goes up or comes down, we cannot immediately decide or know, decipher exactly what made it to go up or come down. Because we don't even know what's consuming the energy, what's not. Optimize facility energy use, improve efficiency of your core building systems. Involve occupants in energy initiative. This is very important. You can never do any sustainability initiative on your own, including energy reduction. And then your building envelope can be a big drain on your energy use. Because we're in the tropics, we can allow uh, windows that don't even close properly or we build with some you know shabby uh, walls and then we just we just put AC inside the place. If you're in a temperate region where you are using water, you are boiling water with gas and using the hot water to cool the the, the uh, heat up the, the the building and you have poorly insulated openings and all that. <laughs> when your bill racks hits you, you will know that your building fabric can destroy you. So you 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 fix your building. You fix your building, your core building systems. Every time a, a, a chiller system or any uh, HVAC system or any mechanical system makes noise, energy is being wasted. Heats up or warms up, energy is being wasted. Vibrates, energy is being wasted because every conversion of energy um, from one form to the other, any unnecessary motion is energy that your electricity is providing to it. It is trying to you know, uh, uh, overcome obstructions and, and pain on its parts to produce the output you determine for it. It produces, those, it uses more energy to give you those wasted uh, 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 conversions that you don't need. And, and energy can be a very subtle, um, very subtle loss in the, in the, in the organization. We see it as something we need, like a must have. Sometimes we look in one narrow approach for our energy source. And then we are oblivious to the wastages that are taking place regarding our energy use. If you are not monitoring today your energy use, you cannot map it to specific value each kilowatt is producing to your organization. You are just looking at your entire uh, uh, facility management as one big operation, not knowing that you are looking at a massive 
iceberg. What you are seeing on top of the water is smaller than what you are seeing under. What is below the radar, what you are not capturing can be much bigger. So think about how much you can immediately contribute to the profit line of your organization by working on your energy efficiency. That's the way to look at it. If I currently spend 60 million a year for energy and I can save 10% because of these efficiency improvements and monitoring I'm putting in place, that's 6 million. Whenever profit is declared, look for your 6 million inside that profit. An organization that is probably spending 16 million in energy costs in a year may not be able to declare 16 million as profits. So where do you start from? Audit your sites, energy audits. You look at all about the building fabric. Where are we losing? And I can we can do this very easily. Let your whole facility be running. If you want to do the manual way, just go around every wall and touch the wall and the windows and see whether the cooling inside can be felt outside when it's hot outside. But a, a better way is to use an infrared thermographic uh, device. These are services that are provided by uh, uh, specialist companies. We do that. Image all of your building around and tell you where your cooling is being lost. If you're in a temperate region, we image it for you. We'll tell you where your heating is being lost because all of that is energy. Then we audit your lighting. Where do you have lights? When should those lights be on? Who uses those lights? What type of lights are they? That audit will yield your total light load, electricity uh, uh, consumed by your lights, uh, how, how, how often they are on or you know, the frequency of coming on and going off, what kind of a system you have in place to ensure that the lights are not on unnecessarily. And then, of course, there are other things, like if you're having uh, toxic material like mercury in, 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 in fluorescent tubes, the impact on the environment, how that affects your sustainability rating and so on. And if your light is the type that generates a lot of heat and you're having air conditioning in that same space, you know, the light generating heat and the air conditioning trying to cool down that space for comfort cooling, you know, all of these things add up to measure uh, how lights affect your uh, energy consumption. And then you have your air conditioning. Your HVAC could be noisy, could be over cooling some places, could be under cooling some places, and so on and so forth. You need to also have that audit. Some HVAC are so old that uh, in a bit to overcome their, 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 their problems, their maintenance problems, uh, over the years, it draws more and more and more energy. That's an equipment that is rated 13 kilowatts, for example, is probably tapping 17 kilowatts continuously to overcome all this resistance that the, the poor maintenance and age is causing on it. Mm -hmm. That difference of four kilowatts alone multiplied by the runtime, multiplied by the, 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 the frequency of coming on in a year can, in some cases, be equivalent of the cost of acquiring brand new systems. But nobody knew this until the audit is done. Every time you say, let's buy a new one, I say, no, no, keep managing it. Nobody has done the audit to tell management that, you know, out of the 60 million we spent on energy last year, 15 or 20 million of it was consumed by the HVAC. And out of that 20 million consumed by the HVAC, this and so and so uh, rating differences from our audits shows that we could have saved 8 million from there. So that you, you use numbers to make your case. And then you have equipment set up in the facility that are always on. The first thing that the TV being on standby is a small, a small consumption, or your laptop always being connected, or some other devices, always printers mm -hmm. going off and on, off and on, off and on on their own. You think it's just little energy. Mm -hmm. 
it adds up. <laughs> I mean, please mute whoever is making that noise. Thank you. All right, so you do the audit. Uh, and then we have certain energy efficiency propositions we'll give, for example. For example, we'll have uh, uh, monitoring to be installed. You have uh, retrofits to be implemented. You have upgrades and so on and so forth, just to get uh, improve your energy efficiency. Uh, Submetering is a very powerful tool for energy efficiency. Many of us have aggregate meters, the whole building, the whole floor, uh, every tenant. But it's important that you have an energy management system that helps you identify what's being consumed by certain specific loads in your facility. You can have a dashboard presented to you that shows you real time live consumption of every um, circuit in your facility. This is something that we deploy very easily these days. We get we get the sensors, and they are, you don't have to always have a meter, um, the, the typical meter that you connect stuff into, right? So uh, you get some sensors um, that are on um, uh, uh, cities, you know, just like. Uh, uh, things that hang around your cables and can feed into uh, uh, the, the cloud, you know, not even necessarily a meter like this. And that information can be presented in the phone, a laptop, or any cloud uh, uh, service where you can see real time cumulative aggregate data and segregated data for energy use for every circuit in your facility. I can sit in one spot managing. Uh, 20 uh, facilities across the country and be able to write a report that tells um, exactly how many kilowatts is being spent on lighting across my locations. Because I'll just shift light, 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 light from 20 locations to get this my total lights. I have water pumps, pump, 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 pump. They are all there. I've metered every one into the system. Total pumps across. So that if there's a decision tomorrow to buy a certain uh, pump that is uh, you know, energy uh, uh, saving and blah, blah, blah. We see the cost, it makes sense or it doesn't make sense, we based on data we have acquired from our historical pump energy use. Same goes for all building systems. So you can make very, uh, uh, you know, uh, strategy, serious strategic decisions or even proposition to management to support you in your energy efficiency if you have uh, a system that monitors. And then for those who are on the, uh, we talked about understanding your energy metering system. Uh, many of us are on the, on the low end, you are using the uh, three, three phase, single phase uh, meters, you are being, you are being built according to what you consume. You are being built under the curve. So the area under the curve is your is your build. So and what what what's in that curve? You have uh, you have time, and you have kilowatts you are consuming. So that's time versus kilowatt hours, right? So if in one hour you have consumed ten kilowatts. That's 10 kilowatts for that one hour. If in the next hour, your consumption dropped to five kilowatts, that's five kilowatts for the second hour. So your total consumption for two hours will be 15 kilowatts hours. That's how normal billing will be done for low uh, users. But for uh, maximum demand meters, those who have skipper meters, you know, big, 
users, industrial users, high rises, hotels, and the rest. You have your own transformer and the rest. There is a factor for providing you that uses a huge load power in terms of generating capacity from the uh, uh, discos that are providing that power to you. That's why they will not bill you under the curve. They will factor your peak. So if you use 10 kilowatts, one hour, five kilowatts, next hours, next hour, and then you use maybe 25 kilowatts uh, the next hour and come down to 15 kilowatts the next hour and all the way down to one kilowatt at night, for example, they will factor that 25 kilowatts into your bill. That's why you can read your meters. Because there's some mathematical formulas that help to factor that your peak into your bill. So if you really want to manage uh, maximum demands, uh, uh, you know, you own your own transformer, you, you want to understand how your billing works, then you need to pay attention here. Watch your peak. Use a, a monitoring system to help you identify when your loads are the highest and target bringing that peak down. Your bill at the end of the month will automatically drop. So you can use one of two techniques, load shedding or load shifting. Load shedding is for activities that drain your energy that you can do away with doing your peak. You're not rescheduling them, you're just doing away with them. So when some companies say 12 o'clock to two o'clock is break time, and we're shutting the chiller, we're shutting down all lights except emergency lights, they know what they're doing. Because that is the time when you have the peak load, but since we are on break, we want to drop that down drastically. That's called load shedding. Cut it off, save it completely. Your peak drops, your total energy drops. But there again, you have another strategy called load shifting. For energy use that you cannot do without, but you can move them away from your peak. Many of us have plus switches, automatic uh, uh, pumps and the rest that once you uh, drop to a certain level in, in, in the tank, water starts from the borehole and treatment starts and then pumping starts and all of those things. And they are happening during your peak. People have loaded the building, energy use has been climbing by 12 o'clock as its peak. Uh, the same way energy use is climbing as people are using your building. That's how the toilets are flushing, pra, 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 pra. water tank is going down. By 12.30, water tank gets to a certain threshold, the pumping starts. The same time as they are flushing, the sewage plant is also uh, uh, filling a certain tank to a certain level, and the pump starts, right? So your peak spikes because of so-called automation. Why don't you use another kind of automation that times, that, that, that schedules those operations. For example, I know that my overhead tank is 3,000 liters and all of us in the building during the peak of, of 11 and five will not use up that 3,000 liters. Water should pump by 10 and pump again by five. I use another kind of automation, not a, a, a level demand pool, but a time-based automation. So by five, I know my tank is going to fill up. By 11, I know my tank is going to fill up so I can cover my peak and make sure my pump does not come on during my peak. I can do that for sewage. I can do that for laundry. I can do that for so many things. Move them away from peak. Move them to off peak. That's load shifting. It saves you a lot of energy. And then we talked about the building fabric, uh, building systems, all of those things that affect uh, the building as a whole. Uh, then there are the smaller things. We call this one of the micro ones. The laptop being on, the standby power for all those TV sets and, and the rest. And of course, your empty fridges that are just left running, thinking that it's not consuming energy. It's consuming a lot if it's left on. Due to your maintenance problem, maintenance can be a huge drain on your energy, which is subtle and silent. Many people don't realize 
poor connections. People are using teeth to peel cables and tie with pliers and, and, and using tape all, all over the place. On our size conductors that start warming up as you know, the appliance is trying to draw energy, uh, leaking insulation, low power factor and voltage imbalances and, and deviation. This all costs you losses. And like I said, every time something warms up and cools up, you've lost energy. Every time something goes burning, you've lost energy. Every time something struggles at all, you've lost energy. That's what they are watching. And then talking about submetering, monitoring your systems is a fantastic way to manage your energy efficiency. Let me give you a challenge, uh, ladies and gentlemen. If you, if you decide to deploy monitoring system for all of your critical circuits in your facility, and you just watch around the clock, every now and then you check what's happening in your facility. Just by doing that, you can reduce your energy cost by 15%. And you guys have told me about your energy, uh, diesel monitoring system, all this technology, I think that Max Middle offers. Just drop your energy bills. I might be to be impressed by what you are doing because you're having the right data to, to take decisions. So for us as facility managers, it's all about uh, knowing what we should be, we should know, applying them in a strategic way, and deploying the right technology to get the results we need for management. All right, so let me hear your questions. That's our class for today. Okay, good evening, sir. So I have a question. Yes, correct. Um, yeah, you spoke about the load shifting. So you are you are moving um load from your peak period to your left peak period sure right okay so yes. i don't know if i really understand the concept but i'm just wondering that if you by the time you shift everything from the critical period are you now not loading another period to make it another peak period uh so you have to you have to you you create that spread deliberately okay, okay. for example yes for example i can put water pumping from three to four i can put sewage treatment from four to five, right? I'm doing the spread myself. Okay. Yeah. Not being generated by the activities of the people in this in the in the building. Exactly. That's... Exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome, Kingsley. Okay, sir. Uh, thanks for the for the knowledge. Uh, my my question is still on base based on load shedding. Mm -hmm. We know all sites have their specific uh, peak period. My peak mm -hmm. period may not be the same peak period with the residents. Sure. So uh, in my own site, my peak period is being a commercial building. My peak mm -hmm. period is from the 12 p.m. 12 p.m. 12 p.m. to uh, 5 a.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, 5 p.m. So 12 in the afternoon to 5 p.m. Okay. okay. So uh, what I've understood so far is um, my major load is HVAC. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, when there's power outage, power coming in, this HVAC tends to start at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that will really tell on my, on my load margin at that time. Mm -hmm. So how do I control that? Because all the units start at the same time. I can't say, let me turn off uh, Mr. B's uh, portion of AC for Mr. A to start. And uh, you know what we call once the, and those unit takes about 10 to, uh, takes about 30 minutes to start coming up. So in this scenario, how do I manage that? And it, it means I have to be there to monitor when there's outage. And um, since all these things are automated, it means I have to be there to monitor when there's outage and quickly impute that uh, load shedding. So how can I help that? The second you, question you, is, sorry, sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Second question is on my pumping uh, aspect, you, you made more light in it. Between mm -hmm. the pump comes on on demand, that is, uh, mm -hmm. it comes on when my tank level is low. Because, so how mm -hmm. do I reduce the amount of time since it is being controlled by a float switch and not this timer? Yes. Yeah, so so it means, just change, just change this flow switch to timer. There's a flow switch, yes. but there's also a timer. But the timer is not controlling. Yeah, there's right? no, there's no timer. There's no timer. Now, so, so you now need to put in a timer, okay. right? 
So if the time, so if the first week says, I need, I need, I need, if the timer does not agree, no pumping takes place. Okay, what if the demand of water now comes down below your, uh, let me say the usage is now no, no, no. more? You cannot start this until you do your baselining. Baselining, okay, that's fine, sir. You first have to measure what people use. How many liters do I pump? How many liters are being used? That's coming out of my tank, right? Per hour. Okay, sir. You have to have that data. So I now say, okay, I have checked. And uh, from 9 a.m. till 4 p.m., I use a total of 2,000 liters, for example. My yes, tank sir. is 3,000 liters. So if I pump my tank to 3,000 liters in the morning, it will be left with 1,000 liters in the evening, right? Yeah. And my pump can now top it up to 3,000 again. Now, that's because I know that what I use is within the okay, storage yeah. I have. Exactly. So if, 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 I, if, I don't, if I don't have that amount of storage, I cannot implement this unless I increase my storage. So I cannot increase my uh, tank to 6,000, for example, 5,000, for example, so that once I fill up, I can take care of the peak period of my pump not coming on. You have to do this line in first, otherwise you'll miss it. Okay, sir. Then on the load shedding. Yes. Um, so, so, so the thing is, uh, your starting up of ACs, for critical users is not load shedding. Your HVAC should start for critical users when it should start, right? It yes, is sir. only loads that are not critical to run at that time that you share. Okay, sir. I think what I'm saying. So even the way we apply load shifting, it is only loads that are not critical to run at that time that you can shift. It's only load that are not critical to run at all that you can share. Okay, a clear example is when a company says, all of you, leave this building when it's break time. If you are here, you're on your own. <laughs> because, because break time load is not critical. We don't need to have AC on you during your break, isn't it? So, <laughs> so if you stay, no problem. Don't forget that you don't have AC. Okay, you're supposed to leave. That's the whole idea. That at that point, the AC is not a critical load requirement. The AC is required for work, not for break time. Break time is elsewhere. Maybe some restaurant or some place you have to go, right? But you chose to stay in the office, then be it the way you can't complain. That's the whole idea of load sharing. Both load sharing and load shifting is non-critical load for that moment that you are dealing with. Okay, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Understood. You're welcome. You hear me? Yeah, thank you very much for that wonderful answer. I want to clarify. You made mention of the fact that uh, if the consumption, especially when you are connected to the national grid and the consumption level is very high, you can regulate it. But in a situation where you are operating less than 30% capacity as regards the facility and they still bill you, you know, from, 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 from you know, okay, you've made mention of them, um, you know, from the peak value and you have complained a couple of times and they are not, you know, reneging on, you know, working on it to support, even when you are still putting into consideration all the necessary factor to ensure that the power consumption is being regulated. So what do I need to do? First, benchmark your public meters using your own energy monitoring system. That's the first thing. You cannot okay. baseline okay. based on the meters and the readings the public supply is giving you. We are currently on a project with a bank today where we are installing sensors on all generators and all uh, uh, public supply in intake so that at a glance, mm. at a glance, they can go to a certain branch in Ikeja today and know that the, the gen is on and the public supply is on at the same time, for example. At a glance, they know that a certain kilowatt hours was used 
from the public supply between this hour and this hour. So that at the end of the day, when your bill comes, it's not supposed to be information to you. You already know what your bill should be. If you depend on okay. what the readings that come to you is, sorry for you, that's the reality of our business, business environment. They will take advantage of you when they think you are not serious about what you're doing. The moment they come to your site and say that you have your own sensors here and there and your additional numbers, they become more careful themselves. They can't exploit you again. So you cannot, okay. you cannot depend on aggregate data for your whole site, no. You have to set up a monitoring system that has sensors here and there that picks data into something that you can use to monitor. Because if you make any change, like when you say, oh, we've done some of those efficiency moves and that, how do you even know that those efficiency moves are actually, actually giving results where you're not having independent metering here and there that gives you results or numbers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you're you. You're welcome. Adela. Thank you. Um, so can you help shed? I didn't really um, understand this submetering explanation. Mm -hmm. I didn't totally mm -hmm. get it. Okay, let me break that down. If, I don't know if Most you can just us, give it. Yeah. Of course I can. Most of us do, we depend on the aggregate meter. At the source, we have the meter that the public supply, this code is stored for us. And we depend on that for everything about energy. That is not sustainable. It's not by any way in a way of baselining. You have to know energy use at different levels. For example, if you're having multiple tenants, every tenant should be metered separately. That's a sub -metering. If you're having different departments, every department, their spaces should be metered separately. That's a level of sub -metering. If you're having equipment, HVAC, air handling units, chillers, uh, this and that, all over the place. You should be able to know what each one is consuming. Take, for example, uh, a client had a very massive event center hall. That event center has 20 ton uh, 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 air conditioners, several of them. The security guards will go in there and just chill at night and put on the 20-ton equipment to keep cool. It's always put off before you come in the morning. Ha. But ha. nobody in management knows that they were incurring 15 to 30,000 Naira every night. <laughs> Why? <laughs> those air handling units or those uh, uh, ACs did not have a submitter. They don't have any way of monitoring their energy use. So when we say set up submetering, it's about having intelligence. You, you become a wizard who knows exactly where it's being consumed. If you're a big company, it's 10 million in a month. Before somebody asks any question, you can break that 10 million down into um, 10 events that are held in the event center. Each of the events cost us cooling of 350,000 each. So that when they are fixing the price for renting out that hall per day, they know how to factor the energy the hall is consuming from just AC alone. And if you have one, uh, a driver's lounge prepared for 40 drivers with five big ACs, and there's only one driver that sits inside there, you know exactly how much that driver's lounge AC is now costing because you've metered it as submitters. You now know that that's driver's lounge that the city one driver that's getting 50K at the end of the month is costing us 300,000 at the end of the month for energy, for cooling that one man. You can tell the guy, please, not best, come. There's another smaller room here. Or there's somebody that used to work late. He works late <laughs> and he says, uh, put on the agent. 200 kV agent is running for him to work late at 9 p.m. Between five and nine, four hours. You should know exactly how many kilowatt hours, how many liters you have born to make that man work. In fact, if it's, it may become cheaper to rent Sheraton uh, 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 lobby or hall for him to walk for that four or five hours or Hilton than to run your journey or facility for him to walk or pack the people who are walking all the floors into one, uh, what we call a, a, a co-working uh, space that you can even use inverter to run 
for the ninth and you put off, those are the kind of intelligence you get from submetry because you now know exactly where your money is entering. You cannot be managing facilities blindly. Energy cost is increasing, it's increasing. We don't know exactly where the energy is going. So that's what submetry does for you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. You mean another question? Uh, yes, I, I, I want to refer you back to that um, sustainable flow chain. I had an experience um, last year. I was uh, invited to, to help um, look into you know, um, a challenge as a result of um, uh, every consumption, uh, water consumption. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, we discover that on a regular basis, uh, you know, they have to work on the pumps, the boosters, and uh, even the M and E people. They are back and forth. So what I now eventually um, um, realized was that, uh, you know, the initial person wasn't paying attention on the consumption capacity, and which is having a great effect because at the end of it, when I came up with the data analysis, I discovered that close to about 3,500 liters of water is being consumed monthly. Mm -hmm. So in such a situation, when I'm coming in now to, to take over, am I going to prepare uh, 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 a document to, 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 to update the management on, on the wear and tears and the need for them to make provision for, because or at what point do we now introduce to them uh, uh, the need for repair or, or, or total overhauling or change. Okay. Base learning starts from when you're taking over. So uh, you do your asset register, you do a commission assessment. These sustainability metrics are part of the commission assessment data you're gathering. So that by the time you are creating your maintenance program or your facility management plan for that site, you already have uh, mm. information on the baselines, what you met on ground. You are creating improvement plan. You know that you can't just come and start operating without showing that you want to improve the system, isn't it? So that's where you need to do the data acquisition and data analysis on what they have on ground so that all the issues are thrown to the surface. Don't wait till later. Do it immediately you're taking over. Okay. Okay. Kingsley. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Sorry, I'm still coming back again as questions oh. are coming back. Uh, my sure. question is based on submitting and uh, yes. we have different mod uh, model or different maker. At mm -hmm. the uh, IPM, because there are some of 600 IPM, 400 IPM, are they mm -hmm. on the same measuring uh, ratio? Because uh, when you say really, IPM, what do you mean by IPM? I'm not really, I just, I do not really Google the okay. interpretation, but that is a measuring okay. ratio. Okay. The measuring yeah. ratio. So, 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 so when you meter, when you do metering, you meter according to the amperage, according to the amperage of that energy consuming assets. So if I have a, if you look at your consumer unit, look at your DB distribution board, huh? yeah. you will see fuses, right? Yes. Each of those fuses have different amperage, 20 amps, 50 amps, 60 amps, 40 amps, like that, isn't it? Yes, sir. Now, if you are going to meter, you use those amperage as the capacity. The, the circuit uh, uh, transformer, the CTs that goes around the cables to help you meter are rated according to those. Just the same way in your typical uh, box meter, uh, you have a fuse. That fuse can be 80, uh, uh, 80 amps, 100 amps, depending on the whether it's single phase or three phase, right? Those, those ratings are because if the energy flowing through is too much for the meter, the meter will burn down. Yeah, they have Okay, rating. exactly. So, so, so you first of all do a, a rating uh, sheet where you do like a data set, you compute all of those and, and it's very easy. I can do that by using a clamp meter just to know the kind of uh, the ratings of each of those sensors. 
I'll use a clamp meter. At the peak time when everything is working, I'll just use clamp meter to read amperage, the record down. It gives me a sense of which particular sensor rating I can use for that particular uh, submeter. Okay? It's yes, not sir. a one size fits all. You okay. cannot expect the same uh, amperage on a, a power coming out of a transformer, for example, as the same as the one coming out of uh, a setting floor or going into a kitchen. You know what I'm saying? They are all yes, different uh, sizes, so the ratings yeah. have to be but actually the, the meters are the same amperage, but it's just different model. Like I have a Siemens, I have a Mojek. So I want to say the metering on Mojek. Let me use Mojek as an example. And the metering on Siemens are they on the same ratio? Because this one can be this one can be measuring higher than what this one is measuring. So, no, no. There's all there's all called calibration. There are international calibration done on meters. Okay. Right. Those are standards that meter producers build into it. So if I want to know whether one meter is going to is going off. I will put one meter on the same cable, put another meter on the same cable from another okay. manufacturer, and see whether they'll give me the same reading, rating. Reading. If they give me just minor slight deviation, I'm fine. But if it is up to one or 1 1.5% deviation, I know that one of them has a problem. Okay. And that's why I bring, I wanted to clear that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So that, that, that's why you see um, uh, we have the, uh, electricity management uh, agency that runs a, a calibration uh, uh, lab. So most meter uh, providers, most meter, those Mojek and the rest, they all ensure that they go for calibration uh, 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 check and certification. And every time you suspect your, the meter they supply to you is going off, oh. demand for recalibration. They'll, they'll take it, recalibrate it, and bring it come with certificates. So that you know that it is giving you the correct reading. The division should not be significant. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Lillian. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, you can speak now. Okay. So I actually dropped my question on the chat. You dropped it on the chat. Let's see. Uh, you can go ahead. I'm still reading it. Okay, let me read it out. I have a situation where my generator technician is always having issues of water finishing before it is required. Always running out of water so that students can take their bath on time. And he keeps coming up with excuses of he has pumped water. Hmm. <laughs> Somebody already commented on your question. That's evil. <laughs> okay, so first thing first, um, Lillian, I cannot blame the technician yet until I see that you have installed a water meter. Okay, install a water meter first on the use line, not the one that pumps the water up. The one that the water comes into the building where they use the water from, install a water meter there. That water meter will tell you how many liters is being used by the building users per time. Once you get that data, you also know the size of your tank. You can use that information to know whether the technician is playing pranks or whether you are actually not producing enough water for the students, okay? Until you have a baselining tool, which is a meter, you can't solve that problem. Is that okay? Okay, thanks. I have one site where when the developer went to the when, when developer went to put a small tank, one thousand liter tank on top of a two story building for thirty apartments, and then they kept complaining about how they are always pumping water and they never water. How can one thousand liters serve thirty apartments? In fact, the pump would be staying on round the clock. That's what it means, because one thousand liters will probably drain out into thirty apartments in less than an hour. 
So the capacity was inadequate and it kept burning the pump because the pump basically run around the clock. So some, some of those things are things that you, you come to encounter because he does not he does not know what each apartment is consuming. He probably assumed that each apartment will not consume more than 20 liters a day. That's why he put a 1,000 liter tank over there. But then that is not the case until you know you don't know. Yes, you have a second question, Lillian, go ahead. Um, you made mention of um, measuring the um, energy consumption per the population in the mm -hmm. environment. So I actually want mm -hmm. to know how possible it is to measure the, the population Come again. for the uh, Speak to your mic, your audio is low. Oh. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, the, the metric for energy measuring energy consumption are the number mm -hmm. of people in certain locations. So I was wondering mm -hmm. how possible. Yes. So once you know you know the total total kilowatt hour consumed per day, and you know how many people are in that building, you just divide it out every day. So once you have a meter in place, you just divide it out and say, uh, for this office, 500 people came to, to the office today and we use 1,000 kilowatt hours, right? Uh, the next day, we use 1,000 kilowatt hours, but we're not up to 500. What could have happened? What did we use that much energy? That's the kind of thing that the metrics does for you. All right, you hear me? Last question, we've passed seven o'clock. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Paul. Um, once the, I want to go back to to um, technology enhancing um, uh, facility management. Mm -hmm. I I want to I want to you know reemphasize on on the you know important. It's not about the technology, real, but what goes into the technology. If you want to clarify that, because I want to believe data, the right information. Because it has been applied, you know, in, in, in the facility I manage, and it doesn't really work as expected. Because, you know, the information, the data captured, they are not really, you know, detailed enough to manage, you know, the sustainability of uh, uh, mm. preempt. Uh, uh, mm. uh, Okay, uh, you may understand. It's garbage in, garbage out. Technology is dependent okay. on on the information you feed into it. That's what it will to make for you. People think that buying okay. software is a solution for anything. It is not. If you don't already have, for example, your asset register, you don't already have your maintenance processes well defined. You don't already have a, a workflow, a work order system in place. Software cannot be used. So you must have accurate data before you can have a software deployed. And that's why I'm starting by talking about this baselining technology like meters, having meters for different things, just to give you information you can put into spreadsheets, for example. Being able to uh, write down okay. the sizes, the capacities. I mean, you don't even know the capacity of the ACs, how many are they? How I would even relate it to the metrics of energy being consumed by AC. You know, so there's so many things that you need to put up or work on data and processes before you start looking for uh, softwares. I think that's where, where the concern is from. from your, and I've seen too many software deployments that turned into billions of naira wasted, hundreds thousands of man hours wasted because nobody looked at data first. If you want to buy software from me today, I can tell you the software will cost you 2 million, 3 million. But preparing you to use the software can cost you 15 million. You will run away because you feel, uh, oh, what is it going to do with that uh, uh, 15 million? I will charge you a thousand naira per square meter to do your asset register. 
a thousand naira per square meter to do your condition assessment. And I'll charge you another thousand naira per square meter to do your process mapping. Your software probably will cost you less than 500 naira per square meter. So that's the truth. But if you think the software is what you are buying, then you'll be making a big mistake. You are only trying to first get your processes and data right, which means you have improved. Software just speeds up. This is some um, questions. Eh? So most of them be questions that are practical. <laughs> Yemi, did you get it? Very well, very well, very well, support. Thank you very much. Right. Very well. Thank very you detailed. so much. Very detailed. See you guys on Wednesday. Pleasure. I think we have had a good time today. Let's meet again on Wednesday for another class. Bye bye. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye-bye, thank you. All right, bye.